I had done all the research, I had found all of the drivers, and I thought I had the perfect solution. Welcome to What Could Go Wrong, Retro Gaming PC Edition. The V765 from Patriot Viper is a mechanical keyboard with all the right specs, whether you're a gamer, content creator, or just an office drone. The aircraft-grade aluminum backplate provides an incredibly rigid deck to support the kale white box switches, ensuring everyone within earshot will know you're better at typing than they are. Combine that with the IP56 dust and water resistance, perky RGB lighting, programmable hotkeys, and custom macros, you'll be sure to strike fear into whoever is on the other end of your headset. Get all the features you want without breaking the bank thanks to the Patriot Viper V765 gaming keyboard. Click the link down in the video description to learn more. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. The NES Classic, PlayStation Mini, SNES Classic, Sega Genesis Flashback, or a Raspberry Pi RetroArch system. As a fan of retro console gaming, those are all great options for reliving a bygone age. For DOS PC gaming, there's DOSBox, which has incredible compatibility for late 90s and early 90s gaming, even being able to run Windows 3.1. But there is an era of PC gaming that is fairly difficult to recreate. Anything more recent than 2005 typically plays well in Windows 7 or Windows 10, even if some tweaking may be required. But what about games from Windows 95 and Windows 98? While most games made for Windows 95 and 98 are 32-bit applications, oftentimes installers or other dependencies were based around 16-bit coding. These 16-bit executables can't run on modern 64-bit operating systems. So, unless your game's installer and dependencies have been upgraded, or received a source port to modernize the game engine, the only surefire way to play games from this generation is to run on native hardware. But do you remember what computers were like back then? Giant beige boxes, loud fans, inefficient cooling. Heck, I had hard drives from that era that were louder than the RTX 2080 that sits in the machine under my desk. I certainly didn't want something like that cluttering up my already fairly cramped office just so I could play Rogue Squadron or Streets of SimCity from time to time. If I was going to have a retro PC, it had to be compact, quiet, and have modern conveniences like solid state storage. Now, I'm certainly not the first person to look at thin client PCs for use as retro gaming rigs. In fact, if you enjoy this kind of content, go give Phil's Computer Lab a look. Not only does he cover a ton of retro hardware and thin client builds, he also keeps a repository of chipset and graphics drivers for Windows 95 and Windows 98 over on his website. He also recently did a video about how to install Windows 98 using nothing but a USB key, and that is definitely worth a look if this kind of hardware is right up your alley. Now, the plan for this build seemed to be pretty straightforward. Find a thin client with x86 hardware and Windows 98 drivers, make sure it had expansion for storage and graphics upgrades, and keep it as small and quiet as possible. What could go wrong? As it turns out, quite a bit. And that's why we're talking about it. Surfing eBay late one night, I stumbled across a listing for a Termtex TK3370LX, an unassuming little beige box with all the right specs for a project like this. The CPU is an x86-based via Eden clocked at 1 GHz with support for both MMX and floating point operations, meaning it should have excellent compatibility with those 90s era games. Also included was 256 megabytes of DDR memory, a 128 megabyte disk on module for storage, a PCI expansion slot, onboard audio, four USB ports, and best of all, an internal power supply, which means no bulky power brick taking up even more space on the desk. The eBay listing, which is still live by the way, was just $30 with $18 shipping, brand new in box. I went ahead and ordered two just in case I needed to hack one up. The plan was pretty simple. First, disassemble the PC and take note of all the onboard components and track down compatible drivers. Next, figure out how to upgrade the memory, storage, and if there's room for it, a PCI video card. And finally, put it all together, install Windows 98 Second Edition, and game like it's 1999. The hardware upgrades all went fairly smooth, considering nothing I am doing here was originally intended to work with this machine. For memory, I went from the single 256 megabyte stick to something a little more gamery in the Corsair 512 megabyte stick running at DDR400. For storage, I opted to go with a compact flash to IDE adapter and a 32 gigabyte card, which is a much better option than the disk on module that was included with only 128 megabytes of storage. Yeah, this is barely enough to hold DOS and a small games library, let alone games that were coming on multiple CDs, as well as Windows 98. 
Now, if the thin client used a standard 44-pin laptop IDE port, 5-volt power would have been included in that connector, and we'd be good to go. Unfortunately, this was a desktop 40-pin IDE port, meaning I'd need to make some sort of adapter to get 5-volt power from somewhere else in the system. The only lead coming off the power supply is a single connector that plugs into the motherboard, and as luck would have it, it actually delivers 5 volts. But if I tapped into that, the drive would be powered on simply by having the PC plugged into the wall, not turning on with the rest of the system. And I'm not sure how a restart or shutdown would work without the PC being able to cut power to the drive. So another source was needed. As it turns out, the single fan header that's on this motherboard also supplied 5 volt instead of the usual 12 volt. So I fashioned a quick adapter by cutting the plug off of a fan and soldering these cables directly to the power delivery on the compact flash adapter. Unfortunately, it seems the compact flash card was a little more power hungry than a fan was expected to be, as the PC would lock up during intensive read and write. Rather than probing around other random points on the motherboard, I decided to go after the 5 volt power delivery on the PCI slot, as there should be ample headroom there, even with a GPU installed. Yeah, it may be crude, but this solder job worked like a charm. Sure, the barrel jack is a little bulky, but it now sits perfectly behind the PCI riser, and the compact flash card has plenty of power, and Windows 98 has been completely stable since making this change. So I got Windows 98 SE and all the associated drivers installed, and figured it was time to install a video card and finally take this thing for a spin. But which card to go with? I wanted to go with as modern of a video card as possible to avoid poor performance in later titles, as well as making sure drivers and APIs were as recent as they could be. Back in the early 2000s, not only could you go with either NVIDIA or ATI, which was later purchased by AMD, there was also 3D effects and their Voodoo cards to consider. 3D effects being sought after collector's pieces now means prices are well into the $100 plus mark per card, and the whole idea with this thin client was to keep the total price under three figures. So, no Voodoo cards for me. Instead, I picked up a trio of GPUs to test out, starting with the ATI Radeon 9500. Debuting back in March of 2003, and intended for budget gaming and low power installs, this card draws only 12 watts, which should make it the perfect card for a build like this. With 64 megabytes of DDR memory, and support for DirectX 9 and OpenGL 2.0, it should meet just about every minimum requirement for games of this era. Representing Team Green is the NVIDIA FX 5500, featuring a whopping 256 megabytes of DDR memory and support for DirectX 9A, although this card also only supports OpenGL 1.5. The FX 5500 launched in March of 2004, and again was intended for low-power gaming PCs. This card does use more power than the Radeon 9500, seeing upwards of 20 watts of draw, but it has the advantage of being available brand new today thanks to new old stock chips still being available. And finally, I was able to snag the NVIDIA GeForce 6200 from EVGA, brand new in box for only $40. However, that's where the good news ends, as this should be the fastest card that I could possibly put into this system, but I was not able to get either of the NVIDIA cards working. I decided to start with the FX 5500, as it had active cooling, and I was a bit worried about heat in such a small case. How's that for foreshadowing? So I installed the card, set up the driver, and was ready to dive into some motocross madness too. And it was around this time that I actually thought to myself that things were going just a little bit too smooth. I was two hours into this project and already firing up a game. Surely something was about to go horribly wrong. Well, yeah, that's why we're talking about it. While I was able to launch the game and get through the menus to start a new play session, as soon as I tried to render anything in 3D, the PC would artifact like crazy and hard lock. Cycling power would get Windows back up and running, but it was the same result every single time I tried launching a game. I figured there was a small chance that I had a defective card, so I swapped out for the G4 6200, only to run into the exact same problem. 2D graphics all displayed just fine, but any 3D acceleration was met with lockups and crashes. I set aside the NVIDIA cards for now and went to the ATI 9500. If power was the issue, this was sure to be the solution. The drivers were a little bit more tricky to install, as they didn't take the first time around, but I did eventually get them working. Hesitantly, I fired up a game, and... it worked! Motocross Madness 2 at 800x600 resolution, 60fps max settings. Thief 2, Simcopter, Rogue Squadron, Dark Forces 2 Jedi Knight, Sim Theme Park, all ran perfectly well and looked just as I remembered them. It was at this point that it all went horribly wrong. Remember how I said I was concerned about heat in this little box? That concern was not unfounded. Now, the Via Eden CPU is designed to sit power at just 10 watts. 
Both it and the Northbridge chipset can be passively cooled in small cases like this without much issue. In fact, before messing with anything at all, this PC would only draw around 23 watts from the wall max. Upgrading the memory from the 256 meg stick to 512 saw the power increase only by 2 watts to around 25 watts at maximum. After installing the FX5500, I checked the power draw again, and that pretty much immediately disqualified this card with an idle draw of 45 watts and managed to pull well over 50 before crashing. However, both the G4 6200 and Radeon 9500 idled at around 30 watts and peaked at just 41, leading me to think that the issue with the Nvidia cards was driver related, not entirely to do with power. So how hot did things get in there? The Via Eden CPU hit a max of 85 degrees Celsius, with motherboard temps reaching 92 degrees. That means there was an ambient temperature of 92 C inside the chassis, which is not exactly the most friendly of environments for any PC hardware. But what was possibly making it so hot? As it turns out, most of the heat was being generated by the feature that drew me to this system the most, and that is the internal power supply. And given the fact that there's little to no airflow inside this case, that was pretty much a disaster in the making by adding any additional parts to this system. At 25 watt max draw, the power supply was getting warm, but not exceedingly hot. The ventilation in this case was more than enough to keep the system running without overheating. However, adding in a GPU and the compact flash adapter raised the power draw by 15 watts and blocked off a good chunk of the ventilation inside this chassis. But what if I were to add some fans? Surely that would fix everything, right? Well, here's the problem. First, remember that fan header I mentioned earlier? With it being only 5 watt delivery instead of 12, that means any fan small enough to fit inside of this case isn't going to be moving much air anyway. These 40 millimeter fans, for example, weren't even able to spin up with anything lower than around eight volts of power delivery. And even then, the airflow was pitiful. Secondly, where am I going to put a fan like this? This is a 40 millimeter Noctua, and it's one of the smallest fans that they make. And there is literally not a single location in this chassis I can even fit this fan, let alone have it pointed at components that actually need to be cooled, namely the CPU and power supply. So we're left with two options. Leave the chassis open just like this, including the exposed power supply that I zapped myself on at least a dozen times over the last couple of months that I've been working on this PC, or I could mod and replace the chassis, losing that PC Classic Mini look that I wanted in the first place. So what did I learn here? The Via Eden 1 GHz performs about on par with a high-end Pentium 2 and low-speed Pentium 3, making it perfect for games of this era. The Radeon 9500 performed like a champ in every single game that I threw at it, and I lost almost 90 minutes playing Thief 2 during testing, let alone with some of the other titles that I loaded up. Not only was the performance there, but everything fit into this chassis with no modifications required. It played the part, it looked the part, hell, even the network driver worked for transferring games from my Windows 10 machine. But in the end, I wasn't able to keep all of those parts cool. And now my Radeon 9500 is artifacting on me and is likely in need of a recap after spending multiple hours in the hotbox. This project is one of the most frustrating that I've done on this channel because it was so close to being a success. But in the end, the TK3370LX just isn't a viable gaming PC, at least when you have a GPU installed. But not all was lost here. The hardware list inside this box did run Windows 98 SE perfectly, had official driver support for all of the hardware, and gaming was on point. The same hardware in a different package might make all the difference in the world, but that's a project for another day. If you're interested in any of the hardware that I used in this failed project, I will have affiliate links down in the video description if you want to try something similar. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description. Thank you all so much for watching this one. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. for today is one that I had not tried before. It is from Fremont Brewing up in Seattle. It is the Winter Ale, actually an Imperial Winter Ale, 8.0%. So a bit on the heavier side for where these seasonal beverages usually fall. Very, very malty. Like, think French bread and holiday spices. That's what I'm getting. That is a 
there's no other way to put it. That is a spicy beer. And I don't mean spicy as in like peppers. I mean spicy as in like holiday spice, allspice, nutmeg, cinnamon. It's like walking into a Joanne Fabrics. There's so much spice in this beer, it's kind of hard to get to the meat of it. Like it's a thick bodied beer. And so I know there's some flavors there, but it's so tingly, I can't suss them out. At just 25 watts max power draw, the power supply was getting warm, but no. I don't know if you can see that from there, but my PC just randomly decided to blue screen on me. Not doing anything at all. So, why are we talking about it? 